All right, y'all, so let's get into 90 Day Fiance. So if you're not familiar with the show, 90 Day Fiance covers people from America who found love abroad in other countries. So in order for them to be with their new potential mate, they have to apply for a K-1 visa. A K-1 visa is basically a process to get someone from another country to America because they're going to marry someone from America in layman's terms. And they have to do so once they reach America, the time ticker starts. They have to get married within 90 days. So that's the premise of this show if you're not familiar with it. Um, and I will tell you right off the bat, if you're new to the show, there's a couple of different types of people. They all fall into one of three categories. You have your people that you're rooting for. You want to see them find love. You believe they're in it for the right reason. You have your people who you're side eyeing because you know they're really not in it for the right reason. Whether it be, you know, a rich old man trying to get a young girl from the Philippines or vice versa. You know, somebody, you know, beautiful model from Russia is marrying this, you know, guy that you know she's really not into for a green card. And then you have your third group that you're really not sure if you're rooting for them, if you're side-eyeing them, and it takes you usually the halfway through the season to figure out what they're really in it for. So usually they're within that three category. So when we start going through this episode, I'll kind of let you know what I think about the couples thus far. So let's start with Annie and Robert. Annie is from the Dominican Republic. They never really said what her employment status was there or what she did for a living. All that we know is that um, Annie has a big family that she, you know, lives within the Dominic Dominican Republic. And Robert is from America. Uh, she's 30 and he's 41. Uh, we know that Robert is a single father, has a cute son. I think he's about six or seven. Um, and that's kind of where... The show started off. We're on uh, episode four, but I can kind of bring you up to speed on the background of these two. They actually met online. Then after meeting online, Robert took a cruise that took him through the Dominican Republic. And he stayed in Dominican Republic for about a day. And they had about eight hours of time together before he decided that he wanted to uh, ask her to marry him. This is a common thread on 90 Day Fiance Day. Normally, just about everybody decided they wanted to get married in <laughs> two weeks or less. You have some that, you know, dated for years or, you know, months. But the vast majority, it was very, very quick engagement. So that is where Robert and Annie are. Um, far as what you missed when she got to America, um, she was surprised to find out that he only had one bed. For her, the son, and himself to sleep in. The little boy doesn't have his own bed. It's, he lives in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, he took her to a thrift store to go shopping. Um, and she said in her country, that's very offensive. So thrift store shopping is something that she doesn't want to do. She says that Robert promised her all these extravagant things. And she thought that she would be wearing Chanel and Gucci and all of these things. Also a common thread in 90 Day Fiance. You always find someone who said, oh, he promised me this, he promised me that. And when they get here, they're just your average American working person. So another common thread in 90 Day Fiance. So in this episode, Robert tells Annie that he wants her to meet Bryson, which is the little boy's grandparents. Now, Bryson's mother is not in the picture. They never really stated why she's not in the picture and why she's not helping raise the little boy. But apparently her parents are very involved in the um, raising of the son. So he wanted Annie to meet the grandparents. Annie immediately had an attitude before she even got there. She felt like the grandparents somehow <laughs> represent his past. And there was no real reason for her to meet the grandparents, which is kind of an indication of her immaturity and the fact that she doesn't have children herself because it is, if you're going to be the mother figure in this child's life, it is important that you meet the other adults in the child's life. But amongst other personality faults, this is one of Annie's. So she already had an attitude. So they meet the grandparents at the park. The grandparents like a really, you know, hip couple, maybe early 50s, maybe. Um, 
and you know they seemed to really love the little boy you know asking questions about how did you meet and it was just a real dry interaction so the grandmothers whose name is stephanie said you know i want to pull you to the side anna annie because there's an anna on the show too not to get those two um mixed up but i want to you know pull you to the side annie and just have a woman to woman talk it went bad. You know, Stephanie started off good. The grandmother, you know, asking questions about her intentions. You know, you know, where did she see herself in Bryson's life? And then somehow it turned to Stephanie asking um, Annie if she was on birth control and if she decided if she had decided she wanted to have children by Robert yet. Yeah, and it just it did not go well. And then also very randomly, the grandmother um Reveal that she's actually a adult. I think she framed it as an adult entertainment actor or something, but actually she's a porn star. That's just the most comfortable word that I can use, but she's a grandmother and she's a porn star and obviously she's been so for years. I don't know why she felt that was necessary to mention, but she did. Um, and I just, I just felt, felt like that was just a really weird interaction. So Annie got frustrated with the questions and just the idea that she would have to talk to her at all and kind of walked away, went back to the, you know, grandfather and the son and Robert at the park. Um, the conversation kind of ended. It was real kind of like dry, nice meeting you, what have you. So in the confessional, the grandparents are like, we don't think she's here for the right reason. You know, we're very protective of our grandson, you know, things of that nature. And she gets in the car, and this is something I don't like that Robert and Annie do a lot. They talk about things in front of the little boy as if the little boy is like a baby. You no, know, he's definitely able to understand what they're saying. And that's the only thing I, not the only thing, but it's one of the things I really dislike about um, Annie and Robert allowing it is the fact that they have adult conversations in front of the little boy. But she expressed the fact that she didn't like the grandmother. She never wanted to talk to her again. And she said that the lady was mean to her. She wasn't mean as much as she was rude. Let's be clear about that. So um, later that evening, um, Robert gets a babysitter. He and Annie go out to dinner. Annie um, is still upset about the, the grandmother meeting, but then she starts to talk about how the grandmother is the past, and not only is the grandmother the past that, but also she went through Robert's uh, Facebook and saw that he still has old pictures of Bryson's mom, and then this is where we find out that Bryson not only has just the um, one son that he's taking care of, he has four other children by four women, so that was like a big reveal for the show because that wasn't revealed prior to. Um, and Annie claims that Robert only told her that he had three kids. And then a couple of days before the visa process was to be finalized, he told her about all of the kids. So that kind of has me kind of looking at him sideways. But I mean, hey, she still came to America. So, you know, she like it. I love it. But um, she was just, you know, real, you know, pressing him about deleting all of his old pictures. And his point was, well, when Bryson gets older, he may want to see pictures of his parents together. He may want to see pictures of his mom pregnant. And then she was just not going for it. And neither was he. That's one thing that amuses me about their relationship. Um, normally when these women come from other countries, for whatever reason, they have this mysticism thing over the men where they can just snap their fingers and say anything and the men jump. Robert is not like that. <laughs> and it's funny to watch them because he is quick to get her together. He is quick to let her know you're not running anything. He essentially told her, I'm not going to erase it. And if I do, what you going to do about it? <laughs> and she was kind of like, well, you can go back and be with him or whatever. But we all know that's not what she's going to do. So, the next couple is Mike and Natalie. Mike is 34. He's from Seattle. And Natalie is 35. She's from the Ukraine. Mike is a farmer. And Natalie is in the medical field in U the Ukraine. Their backstory is they got together um, because Mike's best friend met his current wife. Um, they didn't want to say how they met, but she's from the Ukraine. So they got married. She came to America, got her green card, and they have a child together. So they made Mike the godfather, and they made her best friend, Natalie in the Ukraine, 
the excuse me the um godmother so that is how those two met and i will say mike and natalie are one of the couples that i am rooting for um they really seem to genuinely like each other i feel like it was kind of like a homie hookup though like hey man i found me a woman from the ukraine do you want one i got the perfect woman but still at the end of the day i think that mike has high integrity um he in, um, inherited the farm from his family he seems you know very hard working he had a really bad divorce where he went through a deep depression um gained a lot of weight and then lost a lot of weight and then um, fell in love with natalie um, usually, um, and I mean, this is not to be like racist or anything like that, but on 90 Day Fiance, a lot of time, the women who come from Russia, they do give that Russian bride tea, you know, like I'm beautiful, I'm flawless and I'm just with this man. And there's a couple on here that's like that, but I don't get that vibe from Natalie. I get that she genuinely likes Mike, so I am rooting for them. Um, so the episodes that you guys may have missed is that, um, you know, Mike was saying that he has incurred a lot of debt, you know, getting Natalie over here, going through the K-1 uh, visa process. Um, and, you know, she wants to start talking about having kids right away. And he wants to get out of debt first, which, again, makes me love him. You know, he seems like such a great guy. Um, so the story picks up where she's trying to get here, but there's something holding up the K-1 visa process in Russia. So what he decides to do, even though he's, you know, in debt and, you know, trying to get his money together, he wants to go visit her because it's been several months since they've talked. So he wants to, you know, go visit her and just reinstill in her that everything is fine. So uh, this episode, he's heading to Russia to meet her. Um, then they uh, switch to Natalie and her Russian friends. Her friends, you know, are happy for her, but they are also comparing Mike to her Russian ex-husband, who is a very affluent businessman, apparently, and they're basically wondering if Mike can give her the same lifestyle as uh, her Russian ex. And, I, and this is why I say it's not good for women always to take advice from other women, because... All, even if Mike can't provide her with the same lifestyle, the ex is a ex for a reason. Um, and I know it's easy to say, oh, love, love trumps everything. Money doesn't mean anything. But looking at how Mike lives in that farm, he's by no means destitute. He definitely, you know, makes enough money and makes a living enough to where he can take care of a wife. You know, and even a child if she were to have one. But he just seems more responsible as if that's not something that he wants to do he wants all his ducks in a row so again we love mike um and that was pretty much all they gave us for uh, mike and natalie this episode so next we have and y'all i'm sorry they're picking up trash outside so it's one of the casualties of being a vlogger but um next is one of our couples that we're definitely we're not rooting for or side eyeing we're kind of just scratching our heads about um, that is Marcel, who's 38, and Anna, who is 38. Anna and Annie are two different people. Annie is from the Dominican Republic, and Anna is from Nebraska. Anna is 38 years old. Um, both Marcel and Anna are beekeepers. That's the thing that brought them together. They met online. Common theme on 90 Day Fiancé. Um, they met online. Um, Anna is, they didn't say if she was previously married, but she does have three sons. Um, and Marcel has never been married and he is from, oh my gosh, he is, I forgot to, um, I forgot to jot down where he's from, but he is from the UK. He is from the UK. I forget which country. We'll have it for the next review. Um, but he's from the UK and their backstory is 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 frustrating um he his family does not know that anna has three kids in his culture he's also muslim in his culture is very frowned upon for a woman to have had children out of wedlock so that's what makes me think that maybe anna wasn't previously married because they keep saying that um in his culture that it's frowned upon for a woman to have children out of wedlock and um 
So he's keeping her children a secret from his family back in the UK. They don't know, they know about her, but they know about her three sons. Her sons range from like 17 to 10. Um, but he's very sweet. There's a, a super, super um, a language barrier though. Like the only time they really can communicate clearly is through an app on their iPhone. Um, and that's how they communicate. Um, he says, you know, how to clearly communicate. Now, they do a lot of communication outside of that. Um, you know, he had he has an understanding of simple terms and vice versa. But to have an in-depth conversation with this man, Anna has to literally use an app to speak back and forth. Um the kids are not super excited about the union, especially once they found out that they were a secret. That was the episode that you guys may have missed. Um, so this particular episode picks up on the couple um, out beekeeping. And Anna is just super turned on by the fact that Marcel is into beekeeping. She's talking to him and, you know, trying to hold conversation while they're playing with the bees. He has no idea what she's saying. She has no idea what he is saying. So, um, they go on to go to an engagement party that is planned by the friends. The friends have planned an engagement party because Anna has decided to, you know, she has her friends in the mindset that, hey, we're going to get married. You know, this is my future mate. So, of course, her friends are throwing her an engagement party. The friends are absolutely flabbergasted at the fact that this man barely speaks English and barely understands English. And it's almost painful to watch because it's like Anna talks to him so casually and you can tell like he's like, yes, like this is his favorite thing is yes, <laughs> yes, Anna or no, Anna, like he has no idea what she's saying. And, you know, a lot of people in her circle are like, I would never marry someone who I don't understand. And I have to agree. I mean, there's certain times where she's speaking to, in the previous episodes, where she's speaking to Mar Marcel or Marcel, however you pronounce it. Um, and it almost is like he lacks emotional intelligence because there's been times where she's been emotional about things or they've been talking to the kids about things. And he would say something or respond to something in an offensive way. Not to be offensive, but it's just because of the language barrier. He doesn't understand the situation and he's not able to read the emotion. So it's it's, it's, it's quite a train wreck to see. So um, it kind of ends with a couple of her friends like a little concerned about that um, lack of communication or inability to communicate between the two. The next couple is definitely a side eye couple. Um, we have Michael, that's 42, and Juliana, that's 23. Michael is from America. Juliana is a 23 year old Brazilian model. Michael is a very successful businessman. I don't re really recall what they say he does, but Michael is rich. Um, they, the two met on a yacht. Um, supposedly she was there doing some model work and you know, he was just there, I guess, being an old rich white guy, who knows, but that's how they met on a yacht. So from that time forward, over the last two years, now this is an exception to the rule. They have been dating for two years. Um, they decided to go through the K-1 visa process. She actually got denied a visitor's visa, which is very rare. They would not let her come to America on a visitor's visa because they felt like there was a chance that maybe she was into prostitution. They didn't really get into that much. You know, she says she's never been a prostitute. He said he's never been a pimp. So they're not really sure where that came from. But the K-1 visa process was the only way for them to get here. Um, when asked how much money Michael had spent on Juliana, he did not want to mention, but uh, based on some of the questions and some of the things that he talked about that he's done for her, it's probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars so far over the last couple of years between travel, buying her cars. She has some of his credit cards, have maxed those out. So it's definitely one of those side eye um, relationships. However, I don't think Juliana is 
the classic um, trying to get a green card, gold digger type. She seems like a really, really nice girl. She's just very young. And I really feel like, you know, she talks a lot about how poor they were coming up and some of the struggles that she had being poor in Brazil. So, I mean, who wouldn't take the opportunity to be with a rich guy? You know, if I'm coming from that type of poverty and somebody shows me a golden ticket, why not? You know, so I, I there are some that give that, you know, real gold digger tea. She doesn't. She just gives me that survivor tea. Um, Michael has two very smart, funny kids. I love Michael's kids. I think uh, they're like 9 and 12, the daughter being the youngest and the son being the oldest. Um, they are so intelligent and funny. Like when they do their confessionals, they always are, you would think that these kids are like 19, 21. They are so mature, so smart. They hit the nail on the head with everything when it comes to this relationship, their dad, <laughs> their mom, like they are very intelligent kids. So this particular episode picks up when uh, Juliana comes to America. Um, this is her first time meeting the kids. They instantly have a connection because, of course, she's closer to their age than the dad. And that's not shade. That's just true. Um the kids love her. When he brings her back from the hotel, they've already made um, dinner for her. It's just it's just super cute. They're super cute kids. So um, this is also the dinner where the ex-wife is going to come and meet her. The ex-wife, Sarah. Um, Sarah's hot. I hope Sarah has like found her another guy. Because, I, I mean, she even talks about how it could be intimidating to a lot of women for their ex um, to marry you know, someone half their age, you know, exotic, a model and all these type things, but she's still hot. So I hope she's out there getting hers. But, um, you know, she comes and she talks about, you know, being excited to meet her. And it was really nice. I mean, she hugged her. They sat down. They all had dinner together. Um, you know, it was, you know, very cordial. And then the conversation turns to Sarah, um, and what she expects out of Michael and Juliana's union. She tells Juliana that, you know, basically in layman's term, this is cute what y'all are doing. It's cute that y'all have a relationship. But the only thing I don't want you to do is parent my kids. I don't want you to parent my kids. And, you know, just that simple, you know. And uh, Juliana, she speaks really good English. There's a little bit of a language barrier, but... Um, she kind of got uncomfortable because the air kind of changed because Sarah seems really serious about the fact that you're not their mom. Like you're their dad's wife or fiance, but you're not their mom. And then it's funny when they cut to the confessionals, um, Juliana and Michael are not in the confessionals alone. They're in the confessionals with the ex and they all look like someone just died. So this funny, happy-go-lucky first meeting obviously has changed into something else over time because that confessional nobody was smiling nobody was giddy everybody looked like somebody just died so it's gonna be interesting to see the dynamics in that relationship for the rest of the episode now let's talk about our next couple Sinjin and Tanya Sinjin is 29. He's from Cape Town, Africa. And Tanya is from Connecticut. They are really close in age. Sinjin, uh, Tanya's 29 and uh, Sinjin's 27. Um, they really didn't go into depth what Tanya does for a living. I know they said that she does a lot of um, um, social justice work. She goes out and does a lot of protesting on behalf of a lot of social issues. Um, and they said that Sinjin, you know, he pretty much did like carpentry work back in Africa. Well, the way they met is that Tanya actually met someone online and with only within knowing them for a little while, they paid for her a trip to Africa. So she went to Africa to meet this person that she just met. Turns out that that person wasn't all that they were cracked up to be. So she ended up meeting Sinjin at the bar while she was out, like, I guess, drinking her problems away. Um, and that's how she met Sinjin. Um, Tanya is uh, a control freak, just to cut straight to the point. 
Um, and Sinjin is a free spirit. So I can see down the line that may be an issue. I'm still rooting for them though, because I'm a big advocate in that just because there's one issue or one, you know, common thread in a problem doesn't mean that you should throw the whole um, relationship away. I feel like if they can work through that difference in their relationship, they could really go somewhere. But it just depends on, you know, they really don't know each other that well. I think they said they spent like two months together um, prior to um, deciding that they want to get, you know, engaged. So the story picked up, um, the episode that you guys missed was Sension coming to America and the 90 day, um, clock kind of, you know, ticking down from there. Um, they spent some time in New York because he always wanted to go to New York and Times Square. They spent time in New York with some of her friends, but now this episode picks up when things get real. They actually go home and home is a shed in Tanya's mom's backyard. Um, she told Sinjin that the uh, shit was moving ready. All they had to do was move in and, and, you know, start their new life together. Well, it turns out that nothing is done in the shed. The shed is full of clothes and furniture and cabinets. And it's just, it's a whole DIY project out here. And Sinjin, of course, is kind of frustrated and taken aback. But in my opinion... He, he took it well. You know, I think I would have been a little bit more upset than him. Um, the problem was when they were, you know, cleaning up the shed and get it together, like, Tanya was like this on him the whole time. Like, right here. I mean, every, I mean, any nail that needed to be nailed, any nail that to be taken out, anything that needed to be moved, she was just on the man. And he was just like, I can't live like this. And it's just funny because it's, you really don't know a person until you're, in close quarters with them. And then that's a lot of things that happens on 9 Day Fiance. It's all cute and it's all fun on social media and online. But then when we have to be around each other for a while, then it gets real. So um, we'll see how they go on top of that. Before this episode, they had an argument about his what his career plans were and whether or not they want to have children. Again, some of the basic things that you would think that you would have discussed prior to getting engaged to someone, but that's a common thread on 90 Day Fiance. Oh gosh, and our last couple. This falls into the category of people. You're not rooting for them and you're not side-eyeing them. I'll go ahead and put them in the I'm not sure category for now. Um, and that's the only reason I'm not sure is because of the um, the female partner in this particular situation. I'm pretty sure that the guy is in it for the right reason, but I'm not really sure about this female partner. So the guy is Blake. He's 29 years old from Los Angeles. He was married at 19 and divorced at 23. Um, the young lady is Jasmine. She they didn't really mention what she does for a living, but she's from Finland. Now, I have a conspiracy theory about how they really met. Blake says that he downloaded a dating app. And within 10 minutes, he met Jasmine. And he later found out Jasmine was not also from Los Angeles. She was from Finland. But check this out. Turns out her sister, which they look like twins, her sister won what's called a um, green card lottery. And she was able to come to Finland, I mean, come from Finland to America with a green card faster without going through the normal process. I didn't even know it was a such thing. I didn't know it was a green card lottery out here when they're complaining about people coming illegally, but... That's another video for another day. So here's my conspiracy theory on that. If the dating app was Tinder, which is a huge chance that it may be, I know for a fact that on Tinder, they only match you with people who are in a certain circumference. It's not some radius, certain mile radius from you. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you can almost pick, you know, how many miles away you want people to be from you. So the fact that it turns out later he found out her sister lives 10 minutes from him. I'm wondering, did 
she either used her sister's pictures or her sister's address when she signed up for the app in hopes that she would find someone close to in the proximity of where her sister lives. And then once they get to know each other and acquaintance, she's like, oh, I'm really from Finland. That's that's the that's what I get because I I was on Tinder once upon a time and I know it's not possible for you to meet people abroad on there. It's usually, if I remember correctly, within your a certain radius. So I feel like that was the sisters kind of making sure, okay, I'm here, sister, so I'm gonna get you here, sister. I'm not mad at them, but that's what I think that happened. So Blake is clearly in love. Jasmine is beautiful. She has these model-like features, perfect body, everything. Um, he's been to Finland a couple of times to visit. They decided to go through the K-1 visa process. Um, so the, the episode picks up where he's going to the um, airport to pick her up. He stops by the sister house who lives 10 minutes away to pick her up. So they both go to the airport to, you know, pick up the sister. The whole ride there, he's just doing this. He's talking. He's excited. He's talking. He's excited. The sister is barely talking, right? Um, so they get there, they're at the airport waiting for Jasmine. She comes out and it's, you know, he's so happy to see her, you know, and she's just real monotone about it. So in the confessional, he's like, oh, I can't wait to get home. I can't, you know, actually Blake lives with his mom. Let me say that I didn't mention that Blake lives with his mom. And I'm very curious as if Jasmine knows that, but he decides to, uh, take Jasmine to a hotel, um, instead of going to the mom's house first. So he they go to a hotel for a couple of days and in the confessional she immediately says, "Oh, I want to spend some time alone." Like it's not, "Oh, I'm so happy to be here and I want to spend time with you." It's like, "I also like doing things alone." So she's already setting the stage for I um I'm not that into you. I'm really here for a green card. So We'll see how that goes. Um, she definitely gives me a um, green green card tea. Um, that's my niece, everybody. She's talking to me when she's not supposed to be. But um, so that's it for this episode of 90 Day Fiance. If you don't watch the show, just come watch my reviews. Or watch the show, then come watch my reviews. So thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you for the next one.